So in this session, uh, we're talking about uh, capacity building, and we'll share a couple of resources with you and, and have a couple of presenters um, discuss uh, various things in this session. Um, so uh, today we'll have a, a couple of presenters, as I mentioned. So uh, my name is Shuriji Tara. I'm with the capacity building team here. I'm at the University of Oslo. We also have uh, Alejandra and Matthew who will join me um, in discussing the online academies. Um, so I'll discuss the in-person academies. I'll go through um, a revised academy model as well as some of our resources. Um, I'll also discuss uh, what we call the core team approach um, and how that relates to our capacity building efforts. It's a little bit different than training um, efforts, which uh, uh, might be uh, a bit, bit different for some of you. Um, we'll have uh, Matthew and Alejandra. They'll discuss the online academies with us, along with some updates that they've been working on. And then we'll hear from a couple of our colleagues. We'll hear from Tawange on uh, use of the online academies um, in Malawi. And we'll hear from Saeed from Hispi Ethiopia and Malake here as well um, about how they're uh, performing in-country training um, in Ethiopia. OK, so to start, rather than kind of do this via slides, I just wanted to go through a couple of the resources that we have um, and make you aware of them, because I think actually there's not a lot of awareness around some of these resources. Oh, that's not what I want. So for starters, we actually have a training documentation on the website where a lot of our materials for training are shared. So on top of kind of having, we have some of the academies here, and I'll just go through some of these resources, but we also have a lot of guidance just on kind of general training approaches and how we approach kind of um, implementation of training um, in different countries. So uh, this is, uh, it's a little buried because when you go to docs.dhis2.org, you have to go here to topics and then training docs. So uh, it's a little hard to find actually. We're finding, thinking of ways to make this a bit more visible because there are a lot of um, resources here, but uh, just so you're aware of where to find this. It's also linked in the presentation, which is available on Drifta, um, so you can also access it that way. Um, so here we have uh, quite a bit uh, in terms of our approach to capacity building and how we build um, training programs um, within, uh, you know, our, our, some frameworks that we've developed. So this is based a lot on kind of academic modeling and theories um, from research, from literature, um, and we've taken those and we've made our own um, kind of learning development models that we use um, here um, to develop our own courses and tools um, for the purposes of training. Um, so there's there's a lot of information here. So here's the this kind of model. I'll make this a little bit bigger. I think it's going to zoom out of some stuff. But as an example, we've developed this model based on some other models that exist um, and apply our own methods. And we walk through kind of uh, how we apply this model to develop training programs. Um, in countries and, and work with uh, various materials, etc. So in addition to kind of just general guidance that we have, and we also have a number of our academy courses listed on this page. So even kind of the online academy, there's a number of uh, pieces of information. And you can see this is taken directly from the platform. So if you wanted to kind of get some understanding of the fundamental principles or kind of take these materials and adapt them to your own purposes, um, that is also a possibility. So if you're running your own training programs, um, all these resources are available for you to take and freely customize. Um, for some of these others, I'll also show you they're offered in different languages, uh, not just English. Um, but in, in this case, uh, I, I, I'm not sure if the translations are online for this one yet. Uh, but uh, in any case, all these materials are available for you to take and, and freely use and modify in your own settings. So for a number of our academy pieces, we actually offer quite a, quite a bit of detail um, in terms of various sessions and how we present them. We have guides for trainers if you're introducing a topic. We have guides for learners if you're trying to share materials. Um, with various users um, in your own settings um, in order to kind of help them understand various concepts. And the idea here is not necessarily to kind of run these verbatim, but to give you an outline, and then you can obviously take that outline and utilize that to your own needs and your kind of own extent. Um, so for example, in these guides here, we have all kinds of walkthroughs about you know steps you might want to take um, when you're introducing a particular concept, and you could always take that and modify that um, to your own needs. And of course, we have full examples um, in the documentation that uh, um, would allow you to kind of see some examples and how it's applied. Um, and of course, a lot of explanatory text, etc. This is an example for the trainer um, that gives them information on how to run the session. 
um, and all kinds of considerations on getting started, what they need to test, what they need to have set up before they run that session. Um, and then we also have uh, companions guides, um, which is for uh, the learner as well, which just uh, you know walks through that session, and then you know there's various exercises and examples um, for the learner to utilize. So all of this is available um, on our website here at this uh, tra uh, this training part of our documentation, and we're working on adding quite a bit more um, as we uh, kind of go on. And uh, like I said, I think uh, I just take this. Yeah, and and we are um, actively translating um, this documentation. Um, this is used in our DHIS two academies quite a bit, but it's also available for. This is in Arabic, um, but then we also have several languages. The main languages we have are French, Portuguese, and and now some Arabic as well. Spanish is coming, um, but we're not quite there. Uh, not as far along as some of these other languages. So if uh, you're working in a setting where language is important, um, of course, then we do offer these resources, not just in English, but, but also in other languages um, as well, as this documentation platform is translatable, so um, you're able to do that. Um, so you can take all this and just you know download it as a PDF or um, a Word document, let's say, if you want to do that, and then alter those um, to fit your needs. Okay, so another kind of resource that we offer um, are our training databases. And the training databases, if you wanted to follow uh, any of these types of... So these academy sessions, um, the, all the examples we use are from a variety of different training databases. If, for whatever reason, you were running a training and you didn't have access to a system, um, we do have the training databases that are companions to all this material as well. Um, that you can utilize um, in addition to the material itself. So if you did want to follow the exact same steps, um, this would walk you through all that. And then, you know, all the set, uh, all the data, the metadata, the configuration, everything um, is available to freely use. Um, we are working on um, making, making it a bit easier to find this. Um, so you can download the database, and that way you can use it uh, offline, for example, or on your own server. Um, we, we make sure that it has no personal data of any kind that's real, at least. Uh, there is for Tracker, for example, um, made up personal data that we've modeled. Um, but there's no real data in these and no real users, et cetera. So you can use these um, for your own purposes as well. Um, we have a number of these available um, online as well at any time, but uh, might be useful to offer them more um, as a downloadable resource. So, uh, and we also have these available in multiple languages. I've logged in in, in English, but uh, I'll just switch this one, I think, over to French. Sorry. Let's leave that as English so I can navigate around. But uh, so same type of thing. Well, we offer the resources in, and we try to offer the databases as well um, in multiple languages. Um, so you're able to kind of utilize them um, as needed. Um, the main ones for this are French and Portuguese. Um, we're working on other languages, but that does take a fair bit of time. Um, but uh, French and Portuguese are available for most of our training databases. So if there is for some some need or some reason um, to do that, to use these these systems in your own trainings, um, we do make these available, and you can utilize these um, for your own purposes as well. Well, they are used for the Academy program, I mean, it doesn't matter, right? All these resources are freely available, and you can use them um, to meet your own needs um, for your own training purposes um, as required. Uh, in addition to the various uh, resources we have in terms of kind of materials, so presentations, uh, demonstrations, databases, uh, guides on, on, and exercises um, as to take part in training, we have our, our YouTube page. And there's a lot of information um, here in addition to kind of the normal training um, information. We have a lot of our webinars here. So any webinar that we've hosted, um, it's available here. All the information from the conference will be put here as well. We have a lot of kind of technical um, demonstrations um, that are here as well. Um, we're working on more closely aligning our documentation and the, the YouTube video. I'll actually show you an example um, of that in a moment. But uh, any, any kind of any event we have is recorded here. And then we also make separate videos for the purposes of demonstrating a new feature or providing tutorials, um, et cetera, um, on this YouTube page. So there are a lot of resources that are quite useful. 
um, you know, in particular, like usually I have the video up in DHS2 up on one side and I just kind of pause and kind of follow along. Um, so for example, this the, we have uh, this climate app that Kristen mentioned this morning. We have a full demo of that application um, online that you can follow and, and replicate those steps because we also have a publicly available system um, for you to test that on and you can actually follow all the same steps um, that is recorded in some of these climate videos as well to demonstrate that functionality or try it on your own. So in addition to kind of academy topics and other types of training, we have these different features. CMIS is another one, the education one. So there are other domains and other areas uh, where um, sometimes it's a bit easier for us to communicate that um, via video. So we just post them here um, on the YouTube channel. Okay, um, so we also work on just broad, broad, more broadly speaking in terms of uh, supporting the implementation documentation and guidance. Um, this is a, a new type of uh, kit that we're working on. Um, we, you heard from this morning all these kind of new apps that are coming, capture, um, data entry, maintenance, um, line listing is also a fairly new app. So we have a lot of uh, materials here that assist a person to move from that old version of the app to the new version of the app. This is a bit of a mix of training materials and implementation guidance. And like you can see, we're trying to more closely or in tightly integrate kind of this relationship between all the videos we have and the documentation. So you don't have to move back and forth. Like these will play um, directly in the documentation page. You don't have to go somewhere else. So you can keep reading along, um, look, review the features, review the different parts of it. Um, my computer's on mute, so hopefully no one can hear that. But uh, um, And then you can just keep going and reading things as you need. So we're more tight, tight, trying to tightly integrate um, these various resources. This is an example of moving from event reports to line listing, for example, if you're in an implementation that already uses event reports, um, where you know some people might be using line listing for the first time and not have to worry about this. Um, so here we discuss all the different features, um, um, and there's a number of other pieces here. And then at the end, uh, there's also training material um, for all of this. So there's a training package that is produced. Um, so it's a number of pieces of content that are put together. Uh, this is just an example that I wanted to show you. Um, we have some others um, as well. Um, these are, there's links to all of these um, in the presentation. But I just wanted to kind of share some of these um, just in case you weren't aware of them and let you know that we are developing um, a number of different resources. And we try to be as transparent and share uh, as many of these um, resources as we can uh, going through this process. We're still working on getting better at both communicating them and making them easier to find. Because uh, if you don't know how to navigate the documentation page well, it can be quite challenging at the moment um, to find things. So making them more visible is definitely something um, we'll try to be focusing on um, for the better half um, of this uh, second, year, uh, second half of the year. Um, Okay, so let me just close this for a second. Okay, so before I proceed, um, we wanted to ask you a couple questions, um, and I'll just present this. Where is it? Yeah. So if you guys wouldn't just mind uh, joining this Mentimeter, you can do it for those of you on Zoom. We I see we have quite an audience here online. Um, you can join as well. Um, we just have a couple questions we wanted to ask you in relation um, to the materials that I presented. So we'll give everyone a moment here, and we'll go from there. See some people still scanning the code. So just give it a second here. And leave this open. So I'm just going to ask two questions for now, but we have a couple others. Um, um, so just leave this open um, so you can, that way you don't have to keep logging in. Okay. So first question, were, were, you, at, were you aware of any of these resources? Just kind of curious. Yes, no? Okay, so a fair amount of you were, that's good. Okay, 
Um, which one of these are most useful to you? For those of you who either have seen them for the first time or maybe you've used them before. And if not, we'll, we'll kind of try and figure out how we can help you a bit more. Uh, sorry, the transition kits are kind of moving from old apps to new apps. Uh, that's a new, I didn't really discuss it too much here. Oh yeah, I guess the feature spotlights maybe. Yeah, sorry, I should have probably changed that option to just YouTube videos in general. My mistake. Okay, documentation seems to be the most useful one. Okay, good. And I'm glad that it seemed like a fair amount of you were aware. There's about 60-40 split, so we'll try to do a better job of making that documentation available um, and, and more easily accessible for people. Um, so it's highlighted um, a bit bit better than it currently is at the moment. Okay, so uh, the next thing that I wanted to discuss was our DHIS2 academies. And, and probably everyone here knows about academies. They've heard of them before, um, but we've revised our DHIS2 academy model. And that's what I really wanted to discuss um, right now. So just to brief introduction, so we'll, we're all on the same page. That's just the one slide here. So uh, DHIS2 Academies are meant to introduce the latest features, apps, and concepts, and provide an overview of best practices for implementation. So we're in the process now. They've just released 241. Any new academy you will attend will use 241 or something pretty recent um, as an example. Um, if you're on an older version of DHIS2, that's something that can be discussed, but we're always trying to uh, demonstrate the latest features. Um, these are meant to train core team staff and program staff, so not necessarily maybe a data entry clerk uh, sitting at a district, for example. Um, they're supplemental to in-country trainings, so, so they're not meant to replace any type of in-country training that you perform. Um, and we also hope that they provide you a, an opportunity to network and share. So we've moved away in our DHIS2 Academy model Previously, if you're familiar with this, we had these levels, level zero, which are fundamentals, level one, which was uh, you know, held by the his groups, and, and this level two. But there's a lot of confusion around that model. So instead of using levels, we split up our academies into six categories. And there's no more leveling system. Okay, And the whole idea was to make the pathway much more clear in terms of progress. Right? So, you know, sometimes you had a level two course, there was no prerequisites. You didn't need any previous DHIS2 knowledge, but you took the level two course anyway. And that was fine, but it didn't make a lot of sense. And sometimes there's level ones, you learn many advanced topics, but there was no kind of subsequent progression between them. So if you want to take a tracker use course and a tracker configuration course, even though you're progressing to more advanced topics, they were in the same level and the same category. And people were not necessarily feeling like they were progressing. So we've introduced these six categories to try and kind of uh, mitigate that to some extent. So the first course we have is this, uh, or the first category, I should say, is Intro to DHIS2. Uh, we have DHIS2 Use, DHIS2 Config, Domain and Program Management, Architecture and Extensions, and Conferences. So uh, I'll just kind of go through them real quickly. So our Intro to DHIS2 course uh, just contains one course. It's our Intro to DHIS2 course that Matthew Alejandro and the team um, helped to create and maintain. Um, this is basically where we recommend everyone starts, okay? It doesn't matter what your experience is. It's our most high volume course, I think, and one of our most important um, in terms of just getting started. So if you don't have any previous experience, so we've put it in its own category and we recommend people get started here. Okay, uh, on the DHIS2 use side, um, this is where we recommend kind of core instruction on how to use DHIS2 features. It's not meant to necessarily combine configuration and use um, in the same topic. And we have a number of courses here. It's a mix of online courses, online courses in yellow color, and the in-person courses are in um, white color here. We've also changed some of the course names um, to fall under this model a little bit more. So here we talk about things like using the data visualizer, using tracker capture, collecting data on an Android device, um, creating outputs um, in line listing, in event reports, um, you know, utilizing the core DHIS2 features rather than kind of um, configuring them or maintaining them, for example. Okay. Uh, we then have this uh, DHIS2 configuration category, and this is where we show people how to configure DHIS2. Right? So we have a couple online courses here, our customization fundamentals for aggregate and our events fundamentals, and then we have a number of other kind of um, courses here. Um, that are in person. These are looking at more advanced kind of operations. So configuring tracker, making programs, program notifications, um, things like best uh, practices for form design, managing category, category options, category combinations. Um, also configuring Android. 
So, uh, you know, a number of the features that Nancy showed today, how you actually make those work um, on an Android device, uh, for example. So uh, in this category, we know there's other stuff like scripts, apps, using the API. Um, I'll get to that in a moment, okay? That's not covered in this category, though. Okay, we also have this uh, domain and program management. This is a combination of two topics, uh, two areas. So domain management, kind of illustrating how DHIS2 can function within a particular domain or sector. So we have EMIS, LMIS. Uh, there will be something on climate eventually. Um, and then we have program management. This is more focusing on the information side of implementation. So budgeting, governance, planning, capacity building, scaling up DHIS2. Um, and we have one online course here, um, and the rest are in person. And these are all kind of looking at, uh, broadly speaking, targeting program managers, essentially, right? Uh, you don't necessarily need a lot of DHIS2 specific experience, and you're not going to be logging into DHIS2 and doing a ton of kind of hands-on activities, but it's much more for planning and uh, building a sustainable implementation. Okay, um, architecture and extensions. So this is the category for things kind of beyond DHIS2. And when I say things, I mean technical um, areas. So things like server administration, app development, Android development, um, things like using the API, um, things like um, you know using tools outside of DHIS2, so exporting your data to another system like R or SPSS for statistical analysis or ArcGIS or QGIS or maps analysis, getting your data in the right format, importing data. So this course covers a lot of different kind of technical topics, not or, or the, this category covers a lot of technical topics that are not kind of covered in our intro kind of configuration courses, which is much more focused on the features within DHIS2, whereas this is kind of companion tools. So using things like R, like Postman, like other tools to kind of manage DHIS2. So this is our kind of most IT-centric category, I would say. Um, you need some, some background often in computer science or IT to kind of take part um, in a number of these courses, whereas the other ones, maybe not so much. You know, Usually, if you just have a bit of background, it should be OK. Um, but here, you are using a lot of supplemental tools. You might need to know specific programming languages like React or HTML or SQL. Um, and because of that, um, some IT skills are needed. OK, and then conferences. This is our last category. So we have the annual conference here. Um, but we also have a conference in Asia, and Africa is also considering a regional conference as well. So we're expanding this model um, beyond um, Oslo. And uh, the whole idea, for example, in the Asia region is to focus on those actors specific to the Asia region, focus on what they're doing, give them a little bit more attention, um, and allow them to present um, in a little bit more of an um, environment that they're familiar with. Uh, and, and, and we'll also see um, how the uh, Africa conference turns out as well. I believe that will be a successful event um, that builds on this model. Okay, so uh, in summary here, we have uh, six new courses, and uh, that's across 24 different courses, uh, sorry, six new categories, and that's across uh, 24 courses-ish, 25 if you count the conferences as two, one for Asia, one for Oslo, and maybe one for Africa soon. So uh, we now have a number of courses um, that can kind of assist with this. Um, we have uh, some tools to support kind of picking the right courses as well um, that I'll get to in a moment. So um, you can see we offer a, a lot of different courses at the moment. Now, they're not run every year necessarily, but the whole idea, as I just uh, kind of showed you earlier, um, while we only have a couple of those materials available right now, the idea is all the material from all of these courses will be available on the website. So if you... Maybe you don't attend the course. Maybe if you just want to have some type of training like that in your country, all of those resources, these trainers' guides, learners' guides, presentations, databases for all these courses, we're, we're planning to make those available um, for everyone to utilize um, to fit their needs. Okay. So uh, another area where we've revised things is uh, you know how we develop our target audiences for these trainings, and something we refer to as the DHIS2 core team approach. Um, so I just want to explain this a bit. So this is not necessarily training so much. This is the other part of our capacity building initiatives, which focuses on human resources development. Okay. So uh, the idea behind this core team approach um, is to support, uh, in order to support a DHIS2 implementation, it's really important to kind of have in-country resources, right? So the idea is not always to bring in 
a his group or consultants or somebody else, right? We, we really want to build up the capacity of an organization, NGO, or a ministry of health to kind of do things on their own. And then, you know, when they need some experts, they can always refer to that, okay? Um, but but on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we want to kind of hand over as much capacity as possible. So there's a number of different skills that we kind of believe should be prerequisite for having uh, building a core team. Uh, I'll, you know, you can look over these in a moment. Um, so what we've tried to do is kind of define minimum roles um, that uh, a core that make up a core team essentially. And the reason we've done this is to align our training programs with the needs of these individuals. Um, so we've developed um, detailed terms of references, skill sets um, for each of these roles, and then also identified kind of what we believe um, makes sense in terms of learning pathways for each of these. Now, there could be mixing and matching, of course. Nothing lines up 100% um, in country usually. But the idea is to give a bit of a kind of framework to tie together um, our training initiatives, um, the various resources that you have, how to identify these resources, how to assess their skills, and how to create long-term training plans for them. And I'll discuss this as well um, in a moment. So the idea is that we have, you know, kind of between four to six people um, within this core team, which can vary by country. So, you know, if you have a country uh, of a large size, Indonesia, Nigeria, let's say, you know, 300 million people, uh, you know, four to six people might not be enough. Uh, conversely, four to six people could get a lot done in a country of 10 million, as an example. So it's really dependent on size and, and the context of the location um, to, to define these core teams. So we have kind of four core roles, and then we had four contributory ones. So these contributory ones are kind of those that kind of plug in here or there. They might not always be needed, but, you know, they could be needed from time to time. Um, you know, subject matter expert, for example, if you're developing an NCD program, you might need someone who knows something about NCDs while you're doing that and while you're rolling out that process. And of course, they might be maintaining their M&E um, after that's rolled out as well. So in terms of the core roles, we define four. So this is operational lead, trainer, implementer, and server admin. Um, the idea here is to build profiles and then build skill profiles around this and build kind of educational requirements around uh, what they need in order to get here. So the operational lead is kind of the team lead basically, of this, um, they're kind of co play more of a coordination role. That being said, they need to know about DHIS2 in order to perform this role. So they kind of act as a bit of an inter intermediary between the technical staff and, and partners to kind of, you know, figure out funding situations, build budgets, define governance platforms, long-term ramifications of what's going on, build a developed kind of uh, integrated information architecture. Okay? But they will often, what we suggest is that this person does have DHIS2 experience as well. Um, trainer is another specific role. Um, this is just, you know, having the capacity to develop training materials, to lead trainings, perform training, um, and, and kind of can do both advanced and fundamental concepts. So maybe just training users to enter data and also training users to maybe configure the system as well. And, and while these are very different on the spectrum of, of skill, um, they're both very important. Um, the implementer. So the implementer is kind of this uh, very broad-based role. I guess, but they kind of lead a lot of the requirements gathering and configuration processes, um, and they help to develop and implement solutions. So they'll build forms, they'll build indicators, they'll build reports. Um, some of them might build apps, but uh, that's maybe separate as well. And then the server admin. So we've added the server admin as a core role um, because we do think it's important. And whether that's kind of based locally or kind of hired outside, um, that's kind of up to the implementation. Okay, so going forward, we will be using these kind of this core team approach to identify the target audience of our academies. So if I just pull up one of a, a recent registration page. So we have kind of uh, all the announcement and everything, and then we have the profile of our participants, and we're kind of using the wording that I've just presented as well. Um, and this is to kind of identify, help us identify um, who should we actually be targeting to attend um, these various trainings. Um, um, for, for purposes of kind of increasing their knowledge and skill. So you can see here we have a, a couple different people, um, even the contributory roles uh, we also have um, on this page and some of the optional ones as well. So we're uh, going forward, we're kind of making sure that all of our course development aligns to the roles and responsibilities that we believe are important um, for, for these various roles that we've defined. So in order to kind of uh, help people move along with this concept, we've developed some various tools um, to help with this, because this is maybe a bit of a newer concept in comparison to what we've been traditionally doing, which is 
focusing more on the training side of things, right? Here's some material, here's training. I think another area that we are coming out a little bit more um, where we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot in the past, right, is to really identify now uh, when we're looking at DHIS2, there's a lot more specialized skill that you need. So it was often the case where we kind of had a message that anybody could be trained to do anything. But, but now things are a little bit different, right? We have a lot of different domains. We have a lot of different specific knowledge in configuring DHIS2 and using some specific software or programming language or whatever it might be to develop an app. Okay, uh, And these are more specialized skills than before. So you might need someone with a background, a specific background of skills um, before you start kind of having them embark on that journey. So there's a couple of resources that we have developed um, in order to help with this. Okay, so the first one here is uh, it's probably a bit small, try to make it a bit bigger. Um, we developed this capacity building needs assessment, and the idea is for each of those roles that I've identified, and we have a detailed list of skills um, that we think uh, kind of correspond um, with those roles. And then we have a bit of a description and then a bit of a matrix in order to assess their capabilities. Um, this feeds into something else, another tool that I'll show you in a moment. But the idea is kind of at an individual level, try to determine, well, for this person, where do I envision them? And, and where should they be going? So, you know, the same person who develops proposals and bids and manages budgets might not be the same person that's managing your server, right? So they probably have different skill profiles. Um, and in that case, you wouldn't assess them on everything. You would kind of pick and choose which ones uh, you'd want to assess. But the idea is not to be kind of genitory. Um, the idea is to kind of identify gaps and then build a plan around developing those skills. So in addition to kind of this, uh, oops, sorry. Um, so after the assessment part piece is done, uh, we've then developed a, a template, basically, um, which is to you, you feed in all that information in order to develop kind of long-term plans for building capacity, right? And the whole idea behind this, one is it's twofold, right? One is kind of internally to identify for that person. How will they how will they fill these gaps? And and also how can you follow up with them? Because I think that's one particular area where we haven't been as good at in terms of they attend trainings, but what happens after? You know, you want to make sure they're getting the right skills and, and being able to apply that capacity back in country. Um, but the other is approaching partners. Right? So if you have an actual plan, uh, I think this can be helpful in a lot of ways to approach partners for funding opportunities, for example, to support some of this um, versus kind of um, doing things in a very ad hoc way, which is, I think, in our experience, what we're seeing a lot of, right? Where, you know, people request a specific training and then it's done within a couple of weeks and then this kind of cycle continues. Um, but uh, not, not, not the right people are necessarily building their skills up over time. So we are trying to be more clear in our message that in order to kind of be where you want, um, this is an effort over time. It's not, you can't just attend one academy and then all of a sudden um, you, you, you consider yourself an expert on X subject, right? It is something that is built over time with a lot more. And it's not just meant for trainings. Um, there's other activities like working in projects. Um, and it's not meant for just academies either, right? There could be in-country trainings, as I mentioned. We're working on making all that material kind of more publicly visible, which would hopefully help people to adapt those materials in their own settings as well. Um, and you don't necessarily need to come to an academy to get uh, access to all that information. Oh, yeah, just one more thing. Within this template, this is where we have kind of the... Um, detailed descriptions of these roles. So it includes kind of like TORs, essentially, template t terms of references um, for those who are kind of thinking about uh, what kind of qualifications they need, what type of education and experience they should have, what they would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so this could also help a bit in terms of uh, developing this uh, human resource profiles. Um, and this is an, uh, a new area that we're working on quite a bit. And then in order to help with this, We have this uh, learning pathway tool. Um, this is something Alejandra and I have worked on um, together, uh, which has these roles at the top. And basically, if I were to select one of these roles, it then gives me a recommendation of the various types of training they should have. It doesn't mean they need to attend all these courses, right? They could have a lot of these skills already. But the idea is to kind of give you a bit of information as to what type of, of, of training or education or um, kind of DHIS2 specific skills would be useful for that role, right? 
And then you can always pick and choose how you want to develop that. They might have a lot of those already. You might just do in-country trainings um, for that. It's not meant to you know, send people to academies all the time. I, I, I don't think that's the purpose at all, but just to give you an idea of what type of recommended courses that they could take. And then of course, because that material would be available, you could always have them look at that separately, um, uh, self-paced or, or through somebody else delivering that training. And we have this for both the um, uh, core roles that we've defined, as well as the contributing roles um, that we've defined as well. Okay, so just real quickly, uh, hopefully you guys are still here. Uh, I just have a couple more questions and then I'm gonna hand it over to Matthew and Alejandra and the team. And I'll give everyone a second to go back. Maybe I'll just go back to the front. So I think most people are still here, but I see a couple people scanning, so. Okay. Okay. So in the last six months, which category of DHIS2 training has been the most sought after in your country or organization, let's say? So I think here we're just trying to determine which we, where we prioritize in terms of our resource development. So yeah, it's interesting to see this last box because I think we've reached a bit of maturity in that people want much more advanced configuration knowledge um, than before. Um, so we are trying to work uh, to meet that that requirement. But yeah, we can see. Uh, yeah, it's interesting that this domain and program management is not highlighted so much um, because I think uh, that's an area we do need to kind of think about a little bit more in terms of governance, planning, budgeting. But uh, it's not very popular, I know, uh, to discuss. Okay. Okay. Th yeah. Thank you for this feedback. I think there's a pretty equal spread, other than the the, the yellow box there. Um, um, for which of these uh, DHIS two training categories do you need more support when creating training materials? So it looks like everyone's comfortable with the intro, <laughs> but everything else. Uh... Okay. So a lot on configuration and then more advanced configuration like the API and other things, other tools, huh? Okay, this is good feedback for us. Okay. Are regular reviews performed in your setting to assess staff capacity? Yeah, a lot of no's. Okay, so this could be something interesting to look into a bit more with some of the tools that we developed um, to help with this process. We, we know this is a long-term process, but uh, um, I've shared the links to the tools if you want to have a look. And you can, of course, get in touch with us to learn more um, about this and how you might implement this in your own institutions or organizations. Would a systematic approach to define roles and assess capacity be useful in your setting? Okay, a lot of no's on the last one and a lot of yeses here, so. Okay, so I have made sure to share all those resources with you. Please have a look. If there are any questions, we're happy to discuss that with you more. Um, and if you want a bit more information in terms of, you know, how this might work um, from a re realistic point of view, um, I'm happy to discuss. I'll be here um, for the rest of the week as well. Okay, so uh, we'll get some more feedback later on, but I'm going to hand it over to um, Matthew and Alejandra. Talk about the online academies. Thank you.
Thanks, uh, Shwajit. Can you hear me online as well? Okay. So, yeah, thanks for this uh, 360. Very, very interesting, even for me. <laughs> um, I'm here to speak on behalf of a team uh, who are doing most of the job. You know. Today I'm doing the talking, but they are, they are really the one doing the, the work. So we have Alejandra and Grant and uh, a, third, uh, a third person who's in another room uh, doing uh, uh, work of uh, creating these online courses that I'm about to talk. So what do we have? Uh, who, who knows about DHS2 Online Academy, by the way? Who's who's uh, been in the course, enrolled? A few. Okay. So um, as uh, Shwajit was uh, was presenting you, uh, this is a brick of uh, a capacity building brick or training brick of uh, of our offer at uh, his PIO, and. Um, if you go on uh, on the website, you will see a list of courses. These courses are um, in three languages now. Um, I'll just go there. So we have uh, courses in English, in French, and Spanish uh, for the for the fundament fundamentals of DHIS two, which comprise of four different courses. Um, and um, let me go back. Yes, and just just to uh, uh, to roll back from 2017, uh, we have been more than 17,000 not signups. That's a mistake. But 17,000 certificates delivered, and six for 65,000 plus enrolled uh, students. So um, that's. Uh, these these um, these courses are available twenty four seven, right? So all year round. So the you enroll and then you you it's uh, it's self paced courses. So you it's a MOOC basically for the ones who are who are familiar with uh, with these courses, right? So the the idea is that you enroll and then you go through. But in order to for you to perform properly. Uh, in these MOOC environment, we need to give you the right tools for for you to um, well, not to drop, and uh, actually to get your certificate. In order to do that, we need to have elaborated presentation, elaborated videos, and quizzes. Right. So we're using a we're using a platform which is a uh, which is uh, based on an open source. As uh, as we are in HISP, of course, it's open source. Uh, so uh, open source um, technology, so uh, open EDX, and then we are building different uh, these courses with videos, with demo, with an access to DHS two instances for you to practice uh, at your own pace and to get feedback on your practice. Uh, you get support uh, and you have some interactive uh, sessions as well. So um, and and this is in order for us to build this. Uh, I won't be far. I will be very fast here. But uh, so this is our the life cycle of our courses, right? So from the analysis to developing uh, the course itself, launching it, getting it delivered with the support, and then improving bits uh, um, bits per bits. Um, let me just remove one thing here. So to give you an example of uh, how this works, uh, we've uh, we've uh, detailed exactly how a course production works. So from the writing the scripts to the publication. So I'll go very very uh, briefly. Um, Showing, oops, showing you some. Uh, so first we have some scripting. Where you have a 
sorry, where you have actually, uh, as you can see, you will see it's a very, if it's pretty detailed, we go slide by slide for the, for, for the voice talent to, uh, to record the session, uh, knowing exactly what to do. And then uh, after this, we go on the storyboard, uh, a storyboard part, so which is basically the presentations that you are, where we are, have, we're removing as much text as possible and having as much as interaction as possible for the viewer not to be bored. And then we go in the prototype. So here we use a tool which is not, uh, which is actually not, uh, um, I don't know if this one works. You have an account, right? No? Ta ta! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is a, this is a PowerPoint present, PowerPoint beefed up. Uh, with uh, with uh, with a lot of extra extra um, features, Alejandra could talk much better than me about this one. But for instance, if I take a, a video on uh, uh, a video on um, from intro course, uh, you you get uh, some you get some slides here that are uh, doing working uh, uh, sorry uh, go, going automatically and after and then you don't hear but i mean you can have this being uh, read uh, sorry read by some uh, um, artificial uh, voices in order for you to understand if the pace is the right one and so on and so forth so we're working with this and uh, yes and then we do some uh, obviously some screen uh, screen recording for all the demos. We're using Camtasia for this, and after that we have some voiceover talents who are we're using a platform. Here we will not see the platform, but uh, voices is the platform we, we're using to select the voices. And finally, we're publishing the videos. So the vi this is not the video. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we we. We would definitely uh, no. We don't have the budget for these type of videos, but um, but as soon as uh, yes, this is the video. A bit less exciting, but much more informative. So uh, so the end result is is uh, is what you've seen through. Um, we've worked through PowerPoint, Ice Spring, and then we have the voice talent added, and everything is then. Uh, was producted in order to become this uh, presentation, and sometimes with uh, with demos. More than sometimes, these videos are available, obviously, in the in the through the platform, but they are as well in available through the channel YouTube channel. Right? So we have dedicated and um, uh, dedicated. I lost my words. Um, uh, playlists, thank you. Uh, we have dedicated playlists for each of the courses. Right. This one we don't need, I guess, to go through. Okay, so what does that mean actually to uh, to go from this, from the launch, the delivery, to the maintenance, we, we that means that we need to go through new generation of fundamentals uh, because we're taking the example of fundamentals here. So uh, what, thanks from the feedback we got from our le learners, uh, we analyzed these feedbacks because at the end of each modules, we have obviously uh, some feedback uh, forms. And uh, based on these ones, uh, we decided that we're going to improve the the fundamentals courses with with all these features. So shorter courses, higher interaction, improve instruction, and so on and so forth. Right. So it's a con it, it's a continuous uh, uh, cycle of improvement, hoping uh, hoping to be to make sure that we have as many learners as possible who who are enrolling and then getting the certificates. The completion rate is obviously an indicator we are looking at closely. 
and um, and so these courses they are all available online with no specific target audience. Obviously, it's an, an intro level, right? That means that if you are an expert, you may not want to go through, even though it can be interesting. But uh, that's you're not the primary target audience. But something interesting as well is that since these courses are available 24-7, it can be very good material for uh, our partners to use freely. And sometimes to even integrate these courses uh, into some curriculums. And that's what uh, Lawrence is going to talk about. We are representing uh, University of Malawi. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. So at uh, uh, University of Malawi, we've been using uh, the online DHIS2 online academy. So I'll just go through uh, what we do, but uh, just a quick overview of the university. So it's in Malawi, Zomba. So we are from the computing department where we have four undergraduate courses. Uh, that's uh, computer science, education, computer science, we have information systems and network engineering. So uh, we also have a master's program and uh, the two PhD programs. So from uh, uh, these uh, uh, pro programs, we have uh, final year students who are, are doing different projects and some of them are uh, they need a platform where we can they can uh, experiment or do the actual uh, hands-on stuff, and also uh, in one of the two courses, software engineering and HCI, the students have to do the the practical work. So uh, in those uh, uh, such uh, scenarios, like uh, for those two courses, uh, we develop some use cases. Uh, like the ones which you have think on top and down there, it's just an example for use case. And then we do a maybe one hour orientation of uh, the DHIS2 platform because that's uh, uh, the main which uh, we use uh, for that. And then after that, we ask uh, the students to go into the specifics on uh, uh, the online uh, DHIS2 online, online courses because uh, we can't. Uh, uh, teach them or go through uh, the actual DHIS2 uh, orientation. So we, uh, they have to go, the, uh, to go through the online academy. And of course, uh, they submit a certificate as uh, uh, a part of the assessment just to check if they have gone through, 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 through the process. So in this, uh, they're able to, to use the skills and the knowledge to develop uh, different applications or different use cases so they make use of uh, uh, the DHS2 API. So basically, that's how uh, we use uh, uh, the platform. So uh, through that, uh, students uh, are able to learn uh, how the platform works because uh, we can't uh, provide information for uh, everything. So the online academy helps them to, to learn uh, how the platform works. Uh, and as well, uh, uh, the experimenting with uh, diff they're able to experiment at uh, different ideas on on the same on the same platform. Plus, uh, providing them with a better hands-on experience with industrial handle hands-on tools. Because in Malawi, uh, DHIS2 is used uh, uh, in health. Uh, the national HMIS is in health. Uh, right now, we have the Minister of Agriculture, which is using uh, the DHIS2 platform. So, in that case, uh, they get. Uh, the hands-on experience from a uh, 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 real-world uh, 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 platforms and also uh, the experience. So the students are able to have that experience in uh, online courses. So as you know, where we're going, it's more of online, online, online. So the students are able to have that uh, first-hand experience in using uh, those tools. Of course, the certificates which they'll get at the end of the day they add value to their to their CV, so they're not just going out with a degree, uh, but they have uh, the certifications which will help them to to stand out 
uh, uh, from uh, uh, other 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 students. And uh, uh, we've also used uh, uh, the platform for uh, different uh, implementations which we uh, we have in under uh, our computing department. I'll give an example of IGIS, Integrated Community Health Information Systems. Uh, it's uh, uh, we have the technical read, but we have different partners. So uh, some partners will come in, uh, they'll give us, uh, maybe we'll have the team uh, as part of the uh, implementation team. So for to orient those uh, partners, the staff from those different departments on DHIS2, we we'll provide the basic, but we encourage them still to go for the online courses because uh, they have uh, the online material, the content is rich and they are able to uh, to do uh, uh, to to get to gain the information to get the information and we're able to to use it uh, through throughout uh, the projects. So uh, basically, that's how uh, in our case we're using this uh, online DHIS2 online academy uh, for students and as well as uh, for capacity building uh, with uh, with staff uh, uh, in Malawi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the number one is uh, the private sector. The we have one HMS instance. Interestingly, uh, what's different from other countries is we have one instance where all program routine data is collected, uh, whether it's HIV, TB, immunization, uh, disease registration, uh, like morbidity and mortality, and we have extended uh, the use to other specific use cases as well. Like uh, we have a specialized planning tool within the system that captures uh, planning data, uh, baseline data, target data, and you can do some interesting analysis. We have also included a multi-sectoral nutrition uh, package here, uh, where about uh, eight, I think eight uh, different sectors, uh, nutrition data is collected in the same uh, HMS tool. And we have more use cases that are driven by the extensibility and gener generic feature of DHS2 and uh, requests are coming and we are trying to entertain them. I think we have a specific presentation about this, a kind of presentation on this uh, tomorrow. We'll cover it here. Until now, uh, uh, we have trained more than 10,000 people, uh, not specifically in uh, the or the Ministry of Health, uh, but cascaded trainings uh, whereby uh, health professionals uh, have uh, the necessary skills to capture data and analyze data all the way to the facility level. Uh, the biggest uh, uh, workforce is uh, a specialized uh, health information technician. Uh, all uh, health facilities have such uh, professionals on their, uh, in the, on their books, uh, one or two. And uh, these stuff, their main purpose is to capture data, make sure the data is forwarded to the next stage, uh, mostly using offline instance of DHA2. Uh, but whenever there is connection, they use the online version of it. Uh, on admin levels, there are HITs and MND staff who, whose job is usually to make sure that uh, all the data from the lower facilities are captured and they do some analysis of it. But uh, one challenge is there is high attrition rate, especially with HITs, because the career paths are not well defined and they are not, uh, the compensation is not that rewarding, so they venture to other. Uh, other uh, uh, fields, uh, which the, the ministry is uh, trying to do something about. Uh, so these high attrition rates and the virgin upgrade always necessitate uh, new trainings and refresher trainings, and the ministry had, has to adapt accordingly. Uh, along the way, uh, especially at the ministry level, we, have, we do a lot of coaching, and the course stuff. We do experience sharing through workshops and other means, and uh, we have done some capacity. Uh, building uh, other industry like this uh, on top of the uh, customization academies we do sometimes. Uh, the training approach we have seen over the years, three different approaches. One is we capacitate the core team at the ministry in the region, the, in the cascade. Uh, here, uh, the core team, especially Hispitopia, uh, with some uh, staff from the ministry, we develop training materials. We use the uh, DHS academy training materials as a base. And we do a lot of modification, especially to incorporate local uh, uh, local practices. Like we have uh, 
local apps for data capture, data, anal data quality and analysis. Uh, we do a uh, lot of modification here to incorporate this. Uh, these are reflected in the end user manuals, then the training slides and exercise survey. Uh, the core team provides the TOT uh, to selected staff from the ministry, uh, the regions and other selected patterns, and they cascade it down uh, the, the levels. Uh, but uh, what happens is whenever the, the, the cascade is happening, the quality of the things uh, are degrading uh, from one level to the other uh, uh, because there is no quality assurance. The focus of, on this training is uh, HITC and MXS, uh, another uh, issue. Uh, most of the trainees from the uh, TOT on the way to, down to the facility is focusing on the people that are capturing data and day-to-day -day analysis of the data. Uh, no uh, program people are involved here. So after seeing this, after uh, seeing the quality decrease, uh, what we did was we uh, added, during the cascading, we, we did uh, supporting and oversight mechanisms in this. What we do is during this cascade, cascade trainings, uh, the people who provided the training to these people, like the, uh, training, the people who did the TOTs, like uh, East Ethiopia and some of the core team from the ministry, they observe the next level trainings. They support, they do oversight, and they observe. And so whenever they do, uh, they will get these trainings, uh, they facilitate some of the uh, challenging sessions and monitor the delivery of the sessions. Also. And at the end of the day, we do some review sessions. So what's, uh, what are the challenges faced? What are the uh, uh, things we can improve upon for next day and next trainings? Uh, Whenever uh, they see some deficiencies in these uh, uh, oversight people, they would supplement the information even while uh, even during the training. For instance, whenever some challenging questions are uh, asked, uh, the people from uh, the higher levels will uh, answer these questions. This approach has improved the quality of the trainings a little bit, but the focus is still on, on HIT and MME. Uh, one of the reasons data quality and data use in the country is not as advanced as we'd like it to be. So what uh, is uh, uh, attempted over the years was uh, using academic style trainings. Uh, the first of these trainings was uh, delivered uh, by his Ethiopia. Uh, even the materials are uh, notified by his Ethiopia, but they are uh, supported uh, by NGOs and uh, from the ministry. Uh, request for uh, such trainings are uh, the ministry coming from the ministry because many uh, academy, many partners and some ministry staff were going to regional academies and seeing the quality and uh, seeing the potential. Uh, one such academy was uh, uh, conducted, I think, in 2019 in Denver University, uh, focused on data use and uh, mostly ministry staff, uh, regional HMI staff, and some partners were in here, uh, those people made uh, the core of uh, the data use training in the, in the next uh, uh, three months. But next uh, two efforts were uh, focused on exclusively on customization because uh, the request from these core people was uh, to do some customization. Uh, we have increased uh, skills on uh, customization skills on regional stuff, but uh, the thing is. They are not the ones usually doing actual customization because uh, we have one centralized HMI tool, and that's uh, the customization of and configuration of that tool is uh, mainly managed by uh, the ministry supported by this paper. So, uh, since they are not practicing on it, uh, their, their skills were doing the leak. Uh, but we have tried to complement that by including them in customization uh, workshops in the upcoming years. Um, data use among uh, program staff again was still low uh, because their capacities uh, are not uh, developed over the years. Uh, as I said, uh, the trainings focused on uh, HITs and uh, uh, MND staff, mostly on capture and uh, data use. Program staff are always ignored, even if they are uh, capacitated. Uh, they are uh, riding on some other program or workshop uh, where they are uh, gathered to capacitate on some specific thing, and we take uh, a day or two to give them some introduction on the HIS tools and the like. 
uh, and even with this, only a segment of the program still uh, staff is capacity at the ministry level. At the regional level, this number is not known because uh, they are not targeted. Uh, some uh, regions may have attempted this, but the capacity is still still low. Uh, but over the years, uh, few programs have hired some MND staff. Uh, some of them uh, hired from uh, re uh, the ministries and uh, regional uh, MND uh, people, core MND people. And some of them have transferred to programs and they have been helping in the MND activities using the HSU. Some of the challenges, apart from what I've already uh, discussed, are uh, quality of local trainings is not definitely on par with uh, the HS Academy. Uh, disparity skills in skills also observed. observed. Uh, for many reasons, one of is one of them is lack of proper screening uh, for uh, uh, prerequisite uh, skills. Pastoral skills are uh, different from region to region. Uh, the training delivery mechanisms. Uh, some of them are uh, some of them lack proper uh, uh, exercises because the number of days may be shortened for many reasons. Uh, because of this, the quality is low. Uh, because of this uh, demand for the regional academy uh, style trainings is high, especially uh, by uh, partners and uh, for ministry staff since, since they have seen, they have observed the quality of the training, the delivery mechanisms, and the level of experience sharing uh, gained from there. Uh, so uh, there is the demand, but one uh, challenge that's barring from pe people from participating here is the relatively high cost of attending these regional academies. Uh, another is uh, the limited seats in these academies uh, and the uh, screening. Uh, some of sometimes we have uh, screening with the regional academies. So because of this, uh, it's barring people from participating in these regional academies all, of, all, uh, all over Africa. Uh, moreover, uh, we have uh, many local uh, features within Ethiopia. Uh, these. Uh, Teachers are not covered in these regional academies. Uh, only partners have uh, the capacity and the funds to participate here as well. Uh, they will send their, their staff. Only they, they sponsor one or two people from the ministry when they are going. So because of these demands for uh, such academies within Ethiopia, uh, we are becoming high and his Ethiopia is always requested to, to do such things. And we didn't have the capacity and the funds to do that. Uh, but this year we attempted a uh, first academy, uh, regional uh, DHS style academy. Uh, we uh, did a data use academy, uh, mostly for program staff from the ministry and uh, some partners. Uh, we are uh, planning to conduct up to four a year, uh, mostly themed on data use and tracker use. And from year to year, we can uh, change one of the academies to configuration or a system administration depending on them. Uh, we have customized uh, the materials uh, based on the academy, the DKS2 academy, uh, which Shurajit showed us earlier. We uh, uh, use uh, uh, learning platforms like Moodle. We have customized uh, local uh, Moodle instance. Uh, we are providing authenticator certificates. We check uh, uh, prerequisites, uh, uh, prerequisites like uh, the fundamentals, and we do a pre and post test to see if they are improved up those, those things. Uh, from uh, this year onwards, our focus after putting with the ministry is on program staff because we have seen that most of the staff uh, that are working on day to day uh, capturing and analysis, they have some level of capacity on the HSO, but program staff are not trained. Because of that, uh, the level of data use and data quality is. As, as not as expected. Uh, we also include Ethiopian specific features in these trainings. Uh, we have our own data capture app. We have all our own data quality uh, features within the, that app. We have our own custom data set report app, and we have uh, our own uh, features. So we include those in these uh, in these uh, trainings. Way forward, we are again uh, applying to host up to four of these academies. We are discussing with the ministry uh, to select the next uh, batch of participants, and we are again focusing. The next one is focusing on data as well because the demand there is high. 
uh, we are trying to align with uh, the academy learning paths, which uh, Shurajit demonstrated for us, uh, build capacities and skills across uh, core capacities. Uh, but we have challenges. One of the challenges we have is promoting these academies. Uh, for the regional academy, for the international academy, there is the DHF Academy website. But for local academies, the uh, promotion aspect is still lacking. I think not only Ethiopia, we have other countries have to think about this because we have to fund it. That's the next question. If we, we are not promoting it, uh, many people will not participate. And uh, the funding mechanism is made by, and that will be challenging to deliver the next academy. And uh, spinning and uh, standardization is another challenge. So we want to align with the international level academies, but how do we align the, the we, are, we are mostly basing on Ethiopian features. How do we, we compare the skills gain within Ethiopia uh, to international? Uh, how are we uh, going to uh, measure that? These are uh, the, the challenges we are facing. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, I'm not listening. Thank you. Yeah, so it's almost the tea break here, but uh, if there are any questions, uh, we're happy to answer them. If not, uh, please feel free. It's a uh, yeah, network message. So about the four minutes you are bringing up in the country, um, where are those two steps? Else, be integrated, or are they um, integrated into the USP centers? Follow up question would be who is the one who's paying for the personnel, the ministry or the USP center? Thanks. So, those are good questions. So, the, the core team approach it, it doesn't have to sit in the ministry. It's kind of like a combination of resources, whoever is best suited for the work. That could be ministry staff, and in that case, the ministry would be paying for that. Um, if there is an NGO, maybe, let's say they have a server admin person in the country, and they happen to be much more proficient than the ministry person, then they might be serving that role as part of the core team in country, but they might not be sitting in the ministry. The His Center is usually not paying for any of these, these staff. It's usually uh, an organization that's based there, or the Ministry of Health. In some cases, this team could be entirely comprised of ministry staff, which just depends on the situation. But, but his center is not, not to be. 